So today's agenda, we're going to review some basic screen scraper theory, not too much, but a little bit. We're going to define what I constitute as being a difficult case, a difficult site to screen scrape. I'm going to demo some um, screen scraper tricks. And when you look at what I'm doing, you're going to say, man, that's really un... How do you manage something like that? Well, I'm actually going to show you some ideas for some large-scale deployment of this technique. And we're going to wrap things up with a heartwarming moment with CAPTCHAs and puppies. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is, is some rather unusual ways to do screen scraping, but, but I think pretty effective. You're not going to walk out of here with um, a set of scripts you can use, but I'm hoping that you walk out of here with some ideas. Uh, what I want to do is I want to expose you to some stuff here and kind of get you thinking along some new lines, hopefully. So I'm going to talk about a couple, couple tools, and I had some um, criteria for selecting what I was going to talk about today. They had to meet three criteria. Number one, had to be completely customizable, completely hackable, should be free or open source. And number three, should be platform independent. And generally what I do is I develop in Windows and then I deploy either in Windows or with Ubuntu or FreeBSD. A little bit about me, I am uh, Minneapolis based. I've uh, been writing bots for about 15 years. There's a picture of my city. Um, soon to be Las Vegas bound, hopefully. I'll be living here in a couple months. Um, most of my clients are outside of the U.S., uh, either European or Asian. Um, I'm wearing my DC 612 shirt. Anybody here from DC 612? Yay! Uh, I'm a big supporter of, of local DEF CON groups. Um, seek them out. They're, they're all over the place. And if you don't have one in your area, um, there's nothing keeping you from creating one, so. Um, real quick, uh, back in DEF CON 5 was my first DEF CON. I, uh, reco I uh, recovered. I um, covered it for Computer World magazine. And I think I've only missed three DEF CONs since DEF CON 5. Uh, DEF CON 10, I did an introduction to writing spiders and agents. DEF CON 11, I did one on online corporate intelligence. Two years ago, I did one on executable images. And uh, not only do I keep getting email about that one, I, I get, actually get phone calls yet regarding that particular talk. And today we're going to talk about screen scrapers and scraping difficult websites. Two years ago, I had a book came out, and this is my connection with No Starch. Um, it's available in English, Italian. Supposedly a Russian copy is coming out. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, the Chinese version just came out a couple months ago. So I talk about a lot of kind of traditional techniques and strategies in my book. None of that is obsolete. Basically, the things that I'm showing you today are things you supplement those, um, those concepts and tools with. Okay, why are screen scrapers important? It, it always amazes me. We've got, with the internet, we've got the largest collection of information and services ever compiled. And they're all digitized. You can access them through a common format. And it just amazes me that everybody uses the exact same tools, the browser, to access it, right? It's, it's think about it. I mean, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, it's like every, uh, um, every, every problem's a nail and the solution's always a hammer, right? Um, browsers, in order to do what they're doing and to, to do the wide variety of things that they do, they have to be very general purpose and they make an awful lot of compromises. Um, first off, they're very manual tools and if you have people involved, you're going to get error and it's time consuming, which means it's also expensive to use browsers in, in a corporate um, setting. A browser can't make any decisions for you, like a web bot can. Uh, browsers are not proactive. A browser is never going to go off and tell you when something happened online as it's happening. Um, and what I tell people is that you will never, ever be able to excel by using the same tools that everybody else is using. So if you're doing something online and 
the internet is important, and you use the exact same tools that your competitors are using, you will never get a competitive advantage in doing that. You're just going to, if you're lucky, you'll do as well as your competition. Okay, quick review of traditional screen scraping. By that I mean downloading web pages, managing cookies, uh, handling encryption, uh, server redirection, um, hiding your identity, looking stealthy, using proxies, random timing, trying to look like a person. Uh, emulating form submission is also a very important thing. And parsing information from the web and then taking action on those things that you find. Now all those things are, you, you, there's a, when my book came out I also open sourced a set of libraries for writing spiders and bots and that kind of stuff. And um, if you paid to get in, and if you have a, uh, a CD, um, there's the URL where you can get those libraries. Okay, what constitutes a difficult case? I've noticed that within probably like the last two years, uh, either by design or by accident, a lot of web pages have become much, much harder to scrape. And we'll look at some of those reasons. Um, if you ever go to a, a travel website and you'll, you'll make your query like you're looking for seats or something and then you get one of these little pages kind of like that uh, little northwest thing there where it's like you know waiting processing your your search uh, basically what it's doing is if if, um, if you made a query that takes a long time for it to fetch the stuff in the database they basically give you something to look at and the page just keeps refreshing until your data is ready and then it presents your data. Um, this isn't really a difficult case. This is more of an annoyance and there are ways of handling that, but it's still, it's an annoyance for sure. Um, JavaScript can be, also be an annoyance, uh, especially when JavaScript is used to, mo to automatically modify forms after you hit the submit button. That happens very frequently. Um, and again, there's a URL with a form analyzer that's kind of handy for using on this kind of stuff. And basically what you do is you just, if there's a form that you want to analyze, you download that page, save it as, you know, to your local file, change the action to that URL, and you fill out the form, assuming that you also have all the JavaScript and everything you need. It'll just redirect you to this web page and it does this analysis of the form. And it's, it's pretty handy when you're trying to analyze forms. The thing that's become really prevalent is, is AJAX. And um, AJAX isn't just being used for little things anymore. Uh, it used to be used for things like, um, you know, changing a record in a database or something like that. AJAX is now being used a lot for f flowing content on pages, um, which is kind of bad web design because it basically defeats your, your back button which is something you never really want to do. But like if you go to Expedia or Twitter or a lot of modern web pages, and if you go to the second page of uh, search results and do a, um, a show source, it won't show anything that's on the second page because that stuff is all dynamically flowed. So that, that is a problem. That's, that's a very difficult problem when you're using traditional um, techniques like curl to download web pages. Uh, flash is a problem, primarily when it's used in navigation. Um, there are techniques for extracting text from Flash, so that's not such a big deal. But uh, when it's used as navigation, that, that is a difficult thing. Uh, same thing with dynamic HTML. Um, the other thing that's really gotten bad is some just bizarre cookie behavior. Uh, you'll have... And again, I'm, I'm assuming that the only reason for doing this is to keep people from scraping the, the pages, is you will find, I've seen things like where there is JavaScript that assembles itself after it flows and then writes cookies in certain sequences. Um, I've seen a lot of um, images that are writing cookies. Um, so maybe they saw my talk two years ago, I don't know. Um, but just really strange cookie behavior. And I've tried sitting there with um, you know, analyzing network traffic and stuff and trying to recreate this stuff, and it's really, really difficult to do. 
Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, I've, I've seen this from time to time, where instead of having a name for a form element, you'll get like a, you know, a 200 character hash that seems random. So it makes it very difficult to look for, like if you want to emulate a form looking for the, uh, um, you know, the form name. Yeah. It's, it's a what? Okay. Okay. And and you really don't have to. So, so uh, the, the comment was that was made to uh, as a prevented or um, to prevent cross site scripting kind of techniques. Okay. Um, for me, it's just a pain. It makes it hard to write scrapers. But I'm going to show you how to defeat that. The problem is, is that it, is, with all of the browser's limitations, to a large extent, we're still kind of tied to the browser because the browser does handle all this stuff automatically. Um, sometimes you can fool a server into giving you simpler content. For example, you can, you can um, spoof your bot and tell it it's an iPhone or something, so you'll get possibly simpler content or some kind of mobile device. Um, but the real, the th what I found is that it became very important to find a way to A, emulate a browser and maintain full capability to do anything I wanted to do while I'm emulating a browser. So here's what I came up with. Um, I started using iMacro. How many people here use iMacros? Can I just see a show of hands? Okay, good, good, good. Um, iMacros is a browser plugin. Uh, it's readily available. It, it meets all my criteria as far as being, you know, free, platform independent. It solves every single difficult case that I've mentioned. Uh, when I discovered iMacros and some of these techniques, I swear it was like the gods handing me fire. It was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. This is wonderful. Um, because it, it is an incredibly great tool, and you can hack it very successfully to do things well beyond what iMacros was ever designed to do. And we'll be demoing some of that stuff here today. Um, so iMacro solves all the difficult cases because it uses an actual browser. Okay, that's important. Um, and I'm going to show you a few additional hacks now that uh, turn it into a serious screen scraping tool. Um, so anyway, like I said, it's, it's, um, it's just an add-on for Firefox. It's also available for Internet Explorer. Uh, you just do a quick search on it, download it. It's a real quick and easy install. Uh, once it's installed, uh, you click the little iMacros thing up there, and that will bring up the side panel where you can do things like recording. So if you just hit the record button and enter a URL, for example, fill in a form. This is not my real address, by the way. Um, hit the form, press save, and then stop the macro. And then you can replay it. You can, you can go in, you can pick the uh, current macro, hit play. And uh, I'm going to do a quick demo here to show you how this works. So after, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain a little bit what I'm doing here. Um, after doing a lot of talks, I, I know that it's best to keep your demos as simple as possible. So basically what I have here is I've got a copy of Apache running on my laptop. So this is, I'm not making any network connections outside of this machine. In fact, I'm not even on a network right now. So here's what I do. I've got my URL here. I'm already at the page I want to go to. So here's the uh, little, here's, here's the iMacros um, icon. So you can turn the panel on and off. So I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to click record. And I'm going to hit the record button. And I'm going to start filling stuff out. Where's my mouse? There we go. Okay, so I have filled in the form. I'm going to hit save. You notice stuff happening in the uh, left column? 
okay, so I've got a result now, and I've got a whole bunch of stuff over here. This is the actual macro code over here. So if I hit stop, um, I can choose to save this macro if I want to, or I can just come in here, and I can hit the, the current macro, and I can come over here and say play. And it should redo what I just did. So it loaded the page. I've, I've got excessively long delays here just for dramatic effect. This is going to actually happen much quicker than this. Oh, what happened? I have absolutely no idea how that happened. Good thing I've got a canned version. Here, I'll do the canned version while I'm talking here. Um, so this is this in itself is very useful. Um, basically, it's it's almost like having active bookmarking. So not only can you bookmark a page, but you can actually go through a series of links. So for example, if you have a page on I don't know some newspaper that you like, you could set this thing up to go ahead and and click through whatever links it needs to click through to get to your page. And you could save a copy of it to read later, and you could run it on a cron. I mean, you could do all kinds of stuff like that. This, this in itself is, is somewhat limited, but, but it opens up a whole opportunity, um, whole set of opportunities, as we will see. Okay, so let's look a little bit at what's going on here. Um, the real interesting part is line five, where it's basically saying, okay, go to this form. And here's the name of the element, and I want you to put this content in there. And it does the same thing on line six, seven, eight, and nine. And then on line 10, it essentially hits the save button. And uh, that's what the macro looks like. It's, it's very, uh, very simple stuff. Um, where you don't have tags, for example, like that, that uh, big long, um, I think it was the last one I showed you, the, the difficulties, where you've got the, the form name with the big hash. Uh, you can hit X, Y coordinates to find those. And what I've done is if you have varying lengths of content, you basically do kind of like the way you would do a, a sled if you're doing a buffer overflow error. Instead of having a bunch of no ops, you start clicking lower than where the button's going to be, and you just keep clicking up with the width of the button until you hit it. And it, it sounds stupid, but it works really well. Okay, so here's, here's the way I like to do these. I, I don't run macros the way I just showed you. What I do is I create a template file, and I'll show you a little bit more what I mean by that. Um, and then I run a PHP program that converts that template into the actual macro, and then I run the macro. So this is what my template file looks like. And here, basically all I've done is I've replaced all of the content with a variable. And I like to do something that makes the variable stand out, so it's basically um, you know, pound underscore the name of the variable underscore pound. And it makes it very easy to do the next step where basically I just do some substitution. So that what I'll do then is I'll have my uh, PHP program running and I get some data from someplace and we'll talk about where data comes from later. And I will pull in the uh, template file which I call uh, proto file. And then I just do a whole bunch of string substitutions. So I substitute those variables that I put into the template with actual data, and then I write out the, uh, the macro. So this is a very typical way of the way I, I do things. Now, you can use this technique to do substitutions of field variables, URLs. You can change delay times. You can change destination files. Um, basically, anything you can do with a program, you can, you can change. So it's, it's actually very powerful. Uh, plus, you can also create loops. Uh, you can change data sources. You can send status, status messages to a central server. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. Um, and then I launch the program from PHP. And um, again, I don't know. Well, I guess you can see it. Um, basically, it's, you pull up Firefox, and you point to a uh, particular um, URL that runs your macro. 
Now, generally when I do this, I, I launch these usually from a cron file or some kind of a scheduled task. And I've always had better luck doing this if I either do it from a bash program that calls the PHP, or in the case of Windows, if I have a batch file where that calls the PHP program. The other thing that's important to remember is that if you're doing this on a flavor of Unix, you want to make sure that you designate a display for this thing to, to show on, or else it's not going to work. And you're going to have a very long afternoon trying to figure out why your stuff isn't running. OK, a couple of hints for using iMacros. I always dedicate a browser uh, for using iMacros on a particular machine. Um, and the reason for this is that if you're doing this correctly, one of the first things you do every time you have a session is uh, you clear out all your cookies. And that just kind of makes it difficult for normal browsing if you do that. Um, if you're going to do this seriously, I, I recommend buying the commercial version of iMacros. They actually have their own browser. Um, for no other reason than it gives you better version control. So you don't have iMacros keeping telling you that you've got an update or Firefox telling you you have an update. You know, it's nice to test things before they go into production, and that just kind of makes it a little more difficult. Um, the other thing is um, iMacros is available for Internet Explorer. I don't use that because I found it to be a little flaky. The other thing is that if you're going to be doing this and if you're going to be launching uh, a macro from a cron, it would be to make sure that you've got the iMacros activated in Firefox before it comes up. Or else your macro is not going to run. And again, you're going to have a very long afternoon. OK, um, a couple of things I like to do in iMacros headers is I set a very long timeout. If you set a timeout for 240, that's, uh, what, 240 seconds. What is that? That's like four minutes. Um, especially if you're going through Tor or something where you've got a really slow network connection. Um, time is usually not of the essence, so I just let the things run. Um, I generally tell it to ignore all errors. I clear all the cookies. Um, I close all my tabs, and I'll be showing you the importance of this in just a bit. Um, you have the option of turning images on and off. And if you can get away with not having images displayed, it's probably to your advantage to have images turned off. Um, and again, this is one of those things you can do in the string substitution that I showed you when you're writing your macro. And again, if you, especially if you're going through Tor or some kind of a, anomalizer, it's nice to turn off your images sometimes. The other thing that I do is, is this little thing. If, if you're extracting data, um, iMacros has a way of extracting data, and you can put it into spreadsheets and stuff. If you don't put this little line in here, you're going to get these annoying little pop-ups that come up every time it's extracting data. And if you have an automated system, that just doesn't work. So I always throw this line in there as well. Um, the commands for iMacro are, are really simple. And there's a nice uh, command reference online, as well as user forms and all that kind of cool stuff. OK, so let's look a little bit at where this data might come from. This is um, kind of a, a typical configuration for me. Well, I have uh, my targets off to the left there. And then I have the machine that's running iMacros. I refer to that as my harvester. And then I'll have some kind of a central server, which is usually just a website that I've kind of customized for doing this kind of stuff. So my harvester will go out and periodically poll the central server to ask if it has anything for it to do. And if it does, It'll tell it what to do. So that'll include which websites to use as targets and what data to apply to them. And then my harvester will go out, and it'll download the page. And it'll save screens. It'll parse results. And then it'll send data back up to the centralized server. That, that's very typical in the way I do this kind of stuff. So in large-scale deployment, you can have lots and lots and lots of harvesters, OK? And all of these harvesters are running asynchronously, and they periodically pull the central server, asking for things to do. They go off and they hit the targets, download the pages, parse stuff off, and send the data back to the central server. Now, you can manage a whole bunch of harvesters this way. Uh, the central server can even do things like software updates for the harvesters. Um, basically, what this is is a botnet, right? That's essentially what it is. And this configuration is really 
changed my uh, thinking in terms of how to how to host a, a or how yeah I guess how to host what the serving requirements are for for screen scrapers because um, you really don't need a data center anymore for this because the central server can be some cheap ten dollar a month website that you're using and all the harvesters can be um, you know fifty dollar ten year old PCs that you bought on Craigslist. And if you do this well, and if they're on separate power networks and using separate connections to the internet, and I mean, they can be in separate countries, so you've got all kinds of redundancy built in. Um, none of the stuff that you're looking at generally is anything that isn't already available online, so you don't have security problems. Uh, no data is stored locally, so you don't have any backup issues. So hosting becomes really simple. In fact, one of the things I've been tempted to do is they make these little Linux boxes. They look like, like wall warts. They just plug into the wall, and they've got built-in Wi-Fi. I thought about just taking those and going to some places where they have public Wi-Fi, like, you know, libraries. And you just put a little sticker on there that says, you know, um, security, please do not remove, you know, and just plug it in, and you got another harvester. It, it could happen. Okay. I'm going to show you some, some hacks now to iMacros that make it really effective. Uh, the first thing that I showed you is just a really straightforward iMacros kind of thing. Um, but we need to take it beyond that, which means we need to add a little more programming power to it. Now, iMacros does have a kind of a JavaScript-like programming language, but I don't want to learn anything new. I'm just going to go on, use tools that I've got, and... Um, do something where I have complete total control, and I'm not a big fan of JavaScript to begin with. So, um, iMacros has some limited parsing and data extraction capability, but I, I haven't found any like prepackaged screen scrapers that do as good a job as a parsing script, because your scripts can be written to be fault tolerant and a lot smarter, and can actually make parsing decisions as opposed to looking for things either at static places or with static names. Um, so w without what I'm going to show you right here, iMacros leaves you with a lot of the limitations that browsers have inherently. So what would happen? Here's, here's my hack. Suppose that you could execute iMacros in one browser tab and then open another browser tab and analyze the screen that you downloaded in the first tab. That you could write, you could parse the data, you could read and write stuff to a database, you could pass data back to iMacros, um, you could go open other web pages, you could, you could aggregate information, you could do basically anything you want to do. That's what we're going to do here. So what we're going to do here, I got another demo. What we're going to do is when we get to this point in the first demo, we're going to tack on some extra code that creates a second browser tab. It launches a local PHP program that's running locally on this machine in Apache. We're going to parse the web page that we saved in the first tab. We're going to return the access code back to the first tab. And then we're going to complete our form submission. So you can see at the end here, um, there was this big access code that it gave us that we needed to plug into this other form field to complete the, uh, the ordeal which looks a lot like a CAPTCHA, right? Okay, this is kind of like a simplified CAPTCHA kind of application. All right, so let's go to demo two here. Okay, so it starts like the first one. And it fills out the form. again with dramatic delays. Okay, so it did that. Now what it's going to do is it's going to save a copy of this screen. It opens a second tab. It goes to that tab. It goes to a local program now that's parsing the data. It actually doesn't take this long to parse, but it's giving me some time to speak. Then it goes back to the first tab, and it pulls in the data source. And it's going to throw that number in that field, hit save. And it's, again, dramatic pause. And uh, it takes us to our final screen. Okay, so you saw what happened there, right? 
The first tab grabbed a bunch of information, and even though that was a really simple screen that could have been entirely Ajax created, okay, opens the second, saves that screen, opens the second tab, second tab runs some custom code that acts on the saved data, returns that data back to the first tab, and it completes the process. Um, I'll often have three or four tabs going when I'm doing this kind of thing, and it's, it's really, really powerful. Let's take a little bit, let's look a little bit at what's really going on here. Okay, so basically I tacked just a few more lines of code onto the old macro. Uh, the first one is I'm, I'm saving the screen using a imacro save as command. Then I go ahead and I open up a second tab. I move over to that tab. And then I go to a URL. You, you can use any URL, including local URLs. So I go to a local program that reads the parsed results. And, uh, whoops. And basically, th that program will read the results, send it back in a, in a format that iMacros can read. Then I come back. I open up tab one again. I open up what they call a, a data source, which is basically just a standard comma-separated value file. It reads that in. Um, I'm telling it that I've only got one column of data. And I'm um, showing where the loop is going to exist here. And I just have one piece of data, so there's really just one iteration in the loop. Um, the content has been replaced with the, the value that's in column one. And then I uh, submit the form and I'm done. So it, that's all there is to this. It's, it's really, really simple to really expand the capability of iMacros. And again, you can throw any kind of page at it with any kind of JavaScript or Flash or whatever, and you can handle it. It's, it's, it's a thing of beauty. Um, using additional tabs to run local programs facilitates advanced features that are not possible with iMacros configurations. For example, you can interrupt a macro to do other things like parse data from the pages that were downloaded. You can act on the results. You can interface with local peripherals. In other words, if you want to send a fax in the middle of an iMacro session, you can do that. Uh, you can change your proxy settings if you want. You can aggregate data from multiple web sources or, or websites. You can also aggregate services. Um, for example, maybe you go off and you, um, I don't know, you, uh, for example, maybe you're looking at, um, uh, I'm making this up on the spot, okay? Supposing you have a little business where you buy and sell books. So you find something you think might be a good buy on eBay, you got a bot out there looking at books on eBay, and, you're, and you, your web bot has to make a decision as to whether or not to buy it. So maybe it goes off onto Amazon and it looks at what the sales ranking is, and if it's a good sales ranking and a low price, maybe you got a little formula you run and decide whether or not you want to buy the book. You know, that's the kind of thing you can do with, with this kind of power. Uh, you can also upload data to essential servers in, in mid-macro, which is very powerful. Uh, basically, anything you can do with a computer program, you can now do with iMacros. Okay, I promised you a heartwarming moment. So here it comes. Um, since we're talking about CAPTCHAs, um, Carnegie Mellon is, is the, the, the group, the, the university that came up with the whole CAPTCHA idea. And maybe you've seen this reCAPTCHA. Uh, they're being used everywhere now. They're used on Twitter, they're used on Craigslist. Um, they're used all over the place. Um, Carnegie Mellon figured out that as a population, we do a quarter billion CAPTCHAs every day. So what they did is they came up with this free service for people, and it's, it's a decent CAPTCHA service, it really is. And right now they're getting 30 million uses a day from their reCAPTCHA service. The cool thing about this is that the words that they're using for that, that you uh, need to type in are actually scanned from old documents. Uh, right now they're doing old copies of the New York Times. And what actually happens here is people type, as people complete the CAPTCHAs, they're actually digitizing these old documents for later use, which is a, kind of a, a clever thing to do. So right now when you do your CAPTCHA on Twitter, you're actually digitizing old copies of the New York Times is what you're doing. 
So it's 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 a pretty clever idea, really. It really is. Um, they have an algorithm that they use, and they look to see how many times. Um, basically, they vote. And I don't know how many votes are required to get a legitimate word, but in this case, if uh, you know, fisherman comes up ninety percent of the time for the first word, it's probably fisherman. Um, I, I've I've heard of hacks where people will you get a big group of people together and they all type in the same word until it finally starts to accept it. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I've heard rumors that that, that works. So that, that's how I guess that they're doing it. I, I don't know for a fact, but that's, that's my guess. And they're getting really great success. So the original documents, especially with these really old ones, they're, they're printed on with you know, lead type and whatnot, and the, the type isn't really great. And when they do an OCR translation, um, there are a lot of errors, as you can see in the second example. Uh, but the recapture transcriptions look really clean. So, in addition to this, the other thing that's happening right now is there are services that will solve CAPTCHAs for you. Uh, in fact, they write actual APIs that you can use, which is pretty cool. And unlike the optical character reader solutions that you may or may not have seen at DEF CON over the last couple of years, these are actually solved by real people. And uh, the way it works is, um, not that I would know how this works, but the way I think this works is um, you take your, your image and you send it off to these people and um, most of them are based like in either um, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam. And three individual people are sitting either in an office or in their home with a computer set up to do this. And they'll see the image and they'll type in what they think it is you get three results back, and what you do then is you write some software that basically votes, if, if two match, you can pretty much assume that that's what the real answer is. And um, the um, accuracy is actually quite high. It's, it's, it's a good deal. And it costs about a half a cent to get a CAPTCHA solved. So it's, it's a good thing, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, if you want to find out who's doing this, I would just suggest doing a real quick Google search and you'll come up with a number of uh, organizations that do CAPTCHA solving. So here's how it works. The CAPTCHA is displayed on a web page, and you take the image, the CAPTCHA image, and you set it up in their API, and you send it off to the service, and it's solved not by a human, but by several human beings, and they send you the text back, and um, you enter that into the CAPTCHA box, and the CAPTCHA is solved. Uh, along with some unintentional consequences. Um, basically, it's a feel-good, win-win situation for everybody because uh, you end up with spammers paying to digitize old documents and promote literacy worldwide. And it's true, it's true. And people in developing nations have jobs. And my understanding is that this kind of work puts a lot of college kids through school in places like Pakistan and Vietnam. Um, it's hard to get numbers as to how many people are doing this, but the number that I heard is that it's a $20 million a year business, CAPTCHA solving, at like a half a cent apiece. But do responsible things with this. I don't want to get spam email from all you guys. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we reviewed a little bit of screen, traditional screen scraper theory. Uh, we described why it's becoming more difficult to write scrapers. And we saw that iMacros can solve really all the difficult cases if you can do these second and third tab hacks on iMacros. Uh, it gives you absolute browser emulation capability. It gives you complete control by writing these little scripts that execute in other tabs locally on, your, on the harvester machine. And um, we also looked at managing some large-scale deployments of this kind of stuff. So. I guess I'm done. We have, uh, I think we have a little time for questions. And whatever doesn't get asked here, I'm going to go back to the vendor area where I'll be hanging out at the No Starch booth. So. How, the, the question was, how fast do you get a reply from these CAPTCHA solvers? 
My experience is that it takes between 45 seconds and a minute, typically. And you think about what's going on. There's, a, there's an awful lot of stuff happening during that 45 seconds. So that's, that's really not bad time. And, and most of the bots I run, it doesn't really matter how long it takes for them to run. Not, not these particular bots. Um, other ones are different. Yes? Yeah, the question was um, websites that don't finish loading, essentially, right? Um, I have seen that. And the way I've gotten around it is to turn off images. Because what you're pro... Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you got flash that just kind of like never stops loading. Yeah, if you turn off images, flash goes away. Um, a lot of times you end up waiting for banner ads from slow ad servers, too. And that's what really kills me. So yeah, just if you if you can get away with turning off images, turn off images, and that problem should go away. Really, really. Yes. Um, the question is, have I done any multi-threading with this? Um, no. Um, no, and I can't think of too many times when I'd really have. The, the way I do multi-threading is I would do things. <laughs> I've done some strange things. Generally, I, I do it by either adding more hardware or um, I've had bots running in frames within web pages. You know, uh, That's another way to do multi-threading. You just basically create a whole new instance. Uh, but most things online are very procedural. And that's one of the reasons why I don't use OOP when I program, because the web is very procedural. So, and, I, and I'm an old school Java programmer converted to a procedural PHP programmer. Yes? <laughs> the question is, the question is, can you install iMacros through a ActiveX control. I'm sure you can. I mean, I'm sure you can. And, and, you know, this does run on Internet Explorer, too. So, yeah, I'm sure that's possible. Anybody else? Great. You've been great. And I'll catch you in the vendors area. Thank you very much.